Um, well, it's a really uh, great pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce you all to Kamala Shamsi. Uh, Kamala Shamsi is the author of eight novels, as well as a non-fiction book and a book for children. She's been nominated for pretty much every literary award going, including the Man Booker, the Walter Scott, the Costa, and the Women's Prize, which she won in 2018 for Home Fire. Um, it's a novel that features very prominently in the Open University's MA in English Literature. Um, and I think uh, we might have actually the author of that unit here today, which is uh, wonderful. Um, it's also Home Fire that we'll be focusing on in today's seminar on the hostile environment as Greek tragedy. So a very warm welcome, Carmela. I'm going to be handing over to Carmela initially, um, who's going to be talking on the topic of hostile environment as Greek tragedy. And then I'll ask some questions and we'll at the end open up to questions from you. So do note down any questions that come to you as we're talking. So. Without further ado, Carmela, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, um, and to all of you who are here, and particularly anyone involved in teaching Home Fire. And it, it does um, really just delight me so much whenever I hear that's happening. Um, I thought I would speak a little about um, how this novel came to be and really how it, it does in many ways come out of the hostile environment. Um, whenever I tell the story of how I came to write Home Fire, I started in August 2014. Um, but I think I want to actually start it much earlier as I talk to you. Um, I'm going to start it around 7 7 um, London. I wasn't living in London in, at that time, I didn't move here until 2007. But I was in and out of London quite a lot. Um, I'd already had several books published here. And I think I started quite early on thinking of it as a place where I might one day live, um, which meant I was very aware as I was moving from Pakistan to here with occasional bouts in America, I was very aware of a rapidly changing discourse around migrants, first and second generation, and particularly around Muslims. Um, the term hostile environment itself didn't come to be coined until much later, but I was very aware of it um, from an early point. And I remember I was here when 7-7 happened, when, when the London tube bombings happened. And I remember going onto Google to look up specifically the phrase British terrorist. And the reason I was looking it up was because I was very aware that that phrase wasn't used in talking about the suicide bombers um, and the London tube attacks. And as my Googling sort of basically confirmed what I had thought was that the phrasing used to describe the men, the, the terrorists who had committed um, those acts, was very interesting in what it revealed about Britain's own discomfort with its Muslim citizens. Um, so the phrases they, that we used to describe them was sometimes, quite often, Muslim terrorists, occasionally British Muslim terrorists. Um, at one point, it was even, it may have been the Daily Mail, it may not have been, um, British passport holders. And so there's something but different between being a British citizen and being a British passport holder. Um, British born was often um, brought up as well. And it seemed to me there was a real anxiety and around this time as well. And again, I would come in and out. And every time I sort of left the country and I came back a few months later, it struck me the way this discourse had really flourished about this question of what is Britishness? there seemed a need to identify this rather amorphous thing. And whenever there's a need to identify something, you know it's because there's a desire to exclude, to say there is a definition that is not just about which passport do you carry, there's something else that is um, that there's an anxiety around and it is an anxiety of exclusion and inclusion. Um, 
And there were the question of can you be both British and Muslim at the same time was weirdly to me a question that was actually a subject of serious debate as though Britishness required one set of values and Muslimness required another and these two could, couldn't be reconciled. Um, so that was one kind of conversation that I was very aware of. Um, and I was aware of that before I ever came to live here. But it wasn't that long after 2007, I moved to Britain. I moved here under um, a visa category that existed at the time, which was writers, artists and composers. Um, most people now don't know this existed. It was really a rather lovely category, which sort of acknowledged that if you were a writer, artist or composer, you had something of value that Britain might quite like. Um, and therefore it was a route in. You didn't have to be a Booker Prize winning or Nobel Prize winning writer, artist, or composer. All you needed to do was show that you had, you know, a career in this line, um, that you were earning some kind of living from it. And that would have been enough to get you into the country um, and to eventually get a passport. I came in under that category, not long after I heard that there were plans to change visa rules. Um, and someone said, you must, you should go and talk to an immigration lawyer about it because it might be relevant to your case. I went to see an immigration lawyer who said, oh yes, there are new, there are changes coming around. Things are being moved to a point-based system, um, but there, there's no way they'll be able to fit writers, artists and composers. And our understanding is there's a whole category um, of you know, sort of current, um, well, the whole bunch of visa, current visa categories that will simply remain as they are. Don't worry, nothing to do with you. So I didn't worry about it. I read all this stuff about a points-based system, but I felt assured that the immigration lawyers I'd spoken to were correct when they said, it's not relevant to you. And so some time went by and, and it was coming up to the time that I needed to reapply to extend the category, to extend the visa. And I went online to the Home Office Department. This was before they were called UKBA um, and found to my great dismay that the category I was in didn't exist anymore. And the wording there simply said that I had to find another category I could move into or else leave the country when my visa ran out. Um, I had been in, in Britain for about a year and a half at the time. Um, it's not that I didn't have anywhere else to go to. I could go back to Pakistan. Um, I wasn't a refugee. There was nothing to stop me from living in Pakistan. There was no great horror there at all. But I had come to Britain thinking it was a place that I was going to be living in, and I had started to make a life there. Um, and I loved it. I loved my life in Britain. I loved being a Londoner. Um, it had given me a great feeling of satisfaction the day I got a national insurance number. Um, and so I did feel rather miserable at the thought of having to leave. Um, it so turned out that it happened that I did find out that there was another category I could move into and I was able to stay. But a certain disquiet set within me. Um, I didn't feel safe after that. I kept thinking, I would sort of routinely, every few months, I just have this moment of panic. What if the rules have changed again and I have to leave? And the longer I stayed and the more of a life I created here, the greater that feeling of panic was because I really didn't want to leave. Um, and I realized I didn't trust the system. I didn't trust it to be fair or equitable. Um, I thought at any moment, a whole new set of rules could come in play and I could once again be faced with a screen saying, if you don't fulfill the new rules, you're going to have to go. Um, and so it was with an enormous sense of relief that I finally got five years down the line, indefinitely to remain, and a year after that, uh, citizenship. And when I had citizenship, I remember my, my overwhelming feeling really was a relief, you know, no matter what rules come into play now and how things change. I have this, I can't be asked to leave. It is irrevocable. Um, and then one day I was reading the newspaper and it was 2014, I believe. And the news stories 
was suddenly in a fairly short period of time filled with all these articles about young men. It later became women as well, but and it wasn't only young, but the stories at that point were primarily young men who were leaving Britain to go and join ISIS. And Theresa May was then the Home Secretary, and I read her saying, wherever possible, we will strip them of citizenship. And I thought, hang on, what's this? I had thought once I had citizenship, I had it. I didn't know it was a thing that could be removed. Um, and so I went around reading more and discovered that actually, if like me, you were a dual passport holder, or indeed if you were a naturalized citizen with a claim to another passport, uh, you could in fact have your British citizenship taken away from me, uh, taken away from you. That possibility had always existed, but the British government started using it um, to a degree that was absolutely unprecedented and kept trying to find, to to expand the ways in which it could use it. it. It kept trying to extend its right of taking away citizenship from its citizens, including, it turned out, those who were born in Britain and had never lived anywhere else or had another home. Um, all this stuff to do with the hostile environment was very deep within me the day I turned up in sometime in September 2014. Um, to have a meeting with a man called Jatinder Verma, who I didn't know at all, but who had sent me an email to say, I run Tara Theatre in South London. Will you come in and have a chat? Um, so I went to have a chat and Jatinder said, look, I really like your novels and I like the way you use dialogue. Will you write a play for me? Um, I said, I have no idea how to write a play. He said, yeah, I thought you might say that. So why don't you adapt a play? Because then someone else has done all the hard work. Um, and he was the one to say, you know, Greek tragedy is having a real moment of revival, something like Antigone or the Oresteia in a contemporary Asian or British Asian context might be interesting. I knew the Oresteia, but for some reason, I just didn't pay much attention to it. And, and I sort of immediately glommed on to Antigone. And what I thought about Antigone was, oh God, I know I've read it once. I have absolutely no memory about what it's about. But what I said to him was, Antigone, that's interesting. Let me think about it. Um, so I went off and literally on the train going home, I read the Wikipedia summary of Antigone. And although I was reading about a play that was more than 2000 years old. I read that in all these things that were already very deep inside me and which I'd been thinking about, um, which had to do with citizenship and Britishness and the hostile environment and Britain's sort of crisis around um, its Muslim citizens. All of these things seem to overlay themselves with absolute ease on this very, very ancient story. Um, until that point, I hadn't thought these are things I, I'm going to write about, particularly the, the, the ISIS story, which was only beginning to unfold. And I was sort of consuming it as a news reader. I didn't think I was, you know, consuming it as the novelist. But there was such an immediacy to the way that I thought this ancient story is a story of now. It's a story of British Muslims. Um, and ISIS and government. Um, and I pretended for a while that I was going to write it as a, as a play, but I really don't know how to write a play. And I was at that point a novelist in search of my next novel. And um, it just became very clear to me that this was it, um, that Antigone and ISIS and the hostile environment were going to be this novel, which I did for a long time know was going to be called Home of Fire. So, that's how it all started. Um, Emma, if you want to jump in, um, lovely. Go off that. Wonderful. Thank you, Carmela. Um, so it was really apparent from what you've been saying about the way in which the political narrative impacted your own personal story. And I just wonder if you could share with us a little bit about in the drafting process of Home Fire how you tried to navigate the personal stories 
uh, with the political uh, themes that you might have been exploring? I get asked this question a lot and, and it's always asked as though there is something to navigate and I've mm. never seen what there is to navigate because, um, you know, to me, and this probably has to do with growing up in Pakistan, everyone's lives are always, you know, to, to say, how do you navigate the personal with the political is to me like saying, how do you navigate the personal with the emotional? I don't understand the question, you know. It is a, a very basic fact that, you know, and I think even people who didn't see it before, we saw it in COVID, didn't we? The extent to which we we really live with the illusion that the political is something very separate. And it's, you know, then you come upon these moments where you realize actually whether or not you can leave your house is a political matter. It doesn't only mean that when you can't leave your house, it's political, but when you can leave your house, it is also political. You just don't think of it in that way. Um, I remember some years ago talking to a group of, of American university students who asked me a similar question. And I said, it's only that you right now have the illusion that the political is not very deeply personally entwined with every single thing you do. But there will come a day, and this was sort of around, I think, 2004, and I was really just sort of trying to come up with an example that I thought might appeal to a young woman at an American university. And I said, I mean, if Roe versus Wade is ever overturned, you would stop asking how the political and personal come together, you know. Um, so so I, there, there was never anything to navigate, really. There were, there were characters who were leading certain lives and, and what was happening at the very day-to-day level with them um, was not separate. And because they were British Muslims, they had always known it was not separate from how they were seen and what they could do and what they felt. I suppose there's something that uh, people might think of as overtly political in the home fire in the sense that there is a politician who's one of the main characters. Um, And I wonder whether that was something that was always going to be the case in this novel or was this something that evolved and that seems uh, perhaps something that uh, might need, need need navigating in a different way from the way in which the political might also be personal? Well I mean it was all Antigone's fault you know I mean because with Antigone the primary characters there are the two sisters there is their brother the traitor and well there is their uncle who is the ruler and his son. Um, and when I was thinking about how I was going to make a contemporary story, I thought, well, so obviously the person who is passing down the, the ruling about the stripping of citizenship, I thought, well, I can't have him be the uncle. You can have that in Greek tragedy, but you know, I'm working within the world of realism. So I thought I don't want, so, but there does have to be someone who takes the figure, of, who takes on the, the role of crayon, um, you know, of, the person who can pass down the political role. And I thought, well, I don't want that to be their uncle, but I like that idea that in Antigone, there's some kind of personal connection which makes it all feel more fraught. Um, and I thought, well, maybe he should also be a British Muslim like them. Um, this was, I mean, when I started thinking this, I mean, you know, we didn't even have Sadi Khan as London mayor, let alone Sajid Javed as Home Secretary. So it felt like a bit of a stretch, but it didn't feel like too much of a stretch. Um, I thought it could, that kind of thing could happen, not knowing we were going to be unleashed, you know, or we would have unleashed upon us a series of um, Asian Home Secretaries enacting really racist policies. So that's another story that came later. Um, but I knew that 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 I would have this figure, but again, that I, what I was most interested with him was the personal story, you know, which included his personal ambitions to be prime minister, but it was also the personal question of how he felt um, about his own Muslimness and what he said about it, um, and how he felt about his son becoming involved with this family that was sort of to him the wrong kind of Muslim. Um, so it's always, you always do it you always find the personal in because that is where the novel lives and dies is with your characters. Um, and so you you start with sort of the intimate lives and then you see, well, what else, you know, comes into the story? I, I noticed that the epigraph 
uh, comes from Seamus Heaney's translation of Antigone, uh, the ones we love, uh, enemies of the state. And um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how you engaged with Antigone, maybe different translations, adaptations, the extent to which it was at the forefront of your mind throughout the process or not? When I started, I thought, look, Antigone doesn't need me. Mm -hmm. you know, has been around for a very long time, which was wonderful. And it's so large and, and has such a role in culture that it was very liberating to me that I thought, I don't owe Antigone anything in terms of getting it right. So I thought I'm going to read the play and then I'm going to put it aside. And anything in that play which isn't useful to me in writing a 21st century novel, I'm just going to throw out the window. I was surprised in the end by how little I threw out the window. I mean, I threw out the second brother, you know, because he was of no use. But I was amazed actually by the, the way in which that play really did become the marrow of not just the skeleton, but the marrow of the of the novel. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of work, really. Um, but also, I don't read Greek. So I thought, well, I'll read a few few translations because I knew that, you know, I know enough about translation to know that different things come up or are obscured in different ones. And I thought I'll read a few um, and then I'll just put them aside. Um, and so I read some, you know, God, I don't know, whichever one I'd had at university, which I pulled out. Um, and then I read the Seamus Haney, which of course had in it, you know, you can hear the echo of the troubles, um, but there's also echo of 9-11 of uh, stuff. I mean, there's one point where Haney has Crayon say that line which George Bush said, you're either with us or against us. Um, and that, But the one that actually was most useful to me in some way was the uh, Anne Carson. Um, because I was looking for, again, the human way to get into the character. And it's very easy. I think a lot of the conversation on the play Antigone and the character Antigone um, really like to make it make her into a set of ideas rather than a girl. Um, and it becomes these two sisters, Antigone and Ismene, become contrasting ideas. And so Antigone becomes civil disobedience and becomes, you know, speaking truth to power. And is many becomes compliance. And I thought this doesn't seem really very fair to me. Um, and it was as I was reading the Anne Carson that I really understood where for me the story lay with these two women. Um, and it's very early on. And Antigone, the, the two sisters, let me, for anyone who's as vague or uh, hazy on Antigone as I had been when I had that conversation with Jatinder Verma, um, the play starts with these two sisters and they've just discovered that their brother who has died just died as a traitor um, that their uncle the tyrant has said his body will not be buried that's his punishment even after death his body will not be buried um, he'll be left above the ground for the birds to peck at and the you know, dogs to pull apart and he will not have the religious rights either that are necessary to you know uh, necessary really for death to happen properly and for you to get into the underworld. Um, and as many says, basically, paraphrasing, um, God, this is terrible, but there's nothing we can do. We're girls and our family name is already stained in all kinds of ways. Um, we need to stay out of trouble. And her sister Antigone says, I will bury that body. Um, but then the conversation goes on and is many is saying, I don't want you to get into more trouble. And Antigone says, well, what do you and by trouble? She does mean that she knows that if if Antigone goes against the law, she will be put to death as well. Um, and Antigone says something to the effect of, well, you have already chosen against me. You're not going to help me. You're not taking my side. So what difference does it make now to you what I do or what happens to me? And as many in Anne Carson's version has four words. I'll be so lonely. And that's where I saw the story, which is here are two sisters who have just undergone devastating loss. They both lost both their brothers. And Antigone is now imagining that the, the last thing you can do for someone, which is bury them properly, 
that she won't be able to do that and that that beloved body is going to be ripped apart by animals. And she says, no, it is the most human no, because it is the most unbearable thing to think of this. But her sister's looking at her and thinking, if you do what you say you'll do, you'll be dead too. And then I'll be so lonely. And it's about, to me in that moment, it became about love and grief. And I thought, now I see the human beings. Now I can write it. Um, so the end lesson was really important to me in that. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking as you were talking about the form of Greek tragedy and the title of your talk, uh, The Hostile Environment as Greek Tragedy. Uh, I was just wondering the extent to which you consider your novel Home Fire um, to be a tragedy. I think absolutely. You know, when I was writing it, I, um, I thought I could write it into a different kind of ending. Um, Interesting. I, th I thought it right all the way up to writing the last page when it just became clear to me that there was no other way in which it could go and seem right because the whole situation is Greek tragedy, um, by which I mean not only the Antigone situation, um, but the situation of what was going on with families at the time, with, with families who you know, were losing people because they were being brainwashed or groomed or whatever was going on with them. Um, and, and they went and couldn't come back. Um, and there were these families then left with this loss and horror. Um, in a country that really didn't know how to treat the people who went away as human beings. Um, so when 30, 14, 15, 16 year old girls were going, they weren't being treated as minors. They were going and getting married to 15 year olds were going and immediately marrying men in their 20s. And no one was talking about statutory rape. No one was talking about grooming. No one was talking about brainwashing. It was just terrorism. Um, and that was a deep tragedy as well. You know, so, so yeah, it, 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 it very much, the, the tragic form seemed to me the only mode in which you could tell that story, or in, the only mode in which I could tell that story. Yeah, and um, a, a tragedy that continues uh, off the page, um, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, maybe uh, now would be a nice time to hear you read a little bit from Home Fire, if you wouldn't mind, Kamala. Um, I'm going to read just from the beginning, and I won't read very much because I know some questions are coming in. Um, but this is the very start. All you need to know is it's at Heathrow, and the woman in question is a British citizen who is leaving. Isma was going to miss her flight. The ticket wouldn't be refunded because the airline took no responsibility for passengers who arrived at the airport three hours ahead of the departure time and were escorted to an interrogation room. She had expected the interrogation, but not the hours of waiting that would precede it, nor that it would feel so humiliating to have the contents of her suitcase inspected. She had made sure not to pack anything that would invite comment or questions. No Quran, no family pictures, no books on her areas of academic interest. But even so, the officer took hold of every item of Isma's clothing and ran it between thumb and forefingers, not so much searching for hidden pockets as judging the quality of the material. Finally, she reached for the designer label down jacket that Isma had folded over a chair back when she entered and held it up, one hand pinching each shoulder. This isn't yours, she said. And Isma was sure she didn't mean because it's at least a size too large, but rather it's too nice for someone like you. I used to work in a dry cleaning shop. The woman who brought this in said she didn't want it when we couldn't get rid of the stain. She pointed to the grease mark on the pocket. Does the manager know you took it? I was the manager. You were the manager of a dry cleaning shop and now you're on your way to a PhD program in sociology in Amherst, Massachusetts. Yes. And how did that happen? My siblings and I were orphaned just after I finished uni. They were 12 years old, twins. I took the first job I could find. 
Now they've grown up, I can go back to my life. You're going back to your life in Amherst, Massachusetts. I meant the academic life. The woman dropped the jacket into the jumble of clothes and shoes and told Isma to wait. That had been a while ago. The plane would be boarding now. Isma looked over at the suitcase. She'd repacked when the woman left the room and spent the time since worrying if doing that without permission constituted an offence. Should she empty the clothes out into a haphazard pile, or would that make things even worse? She stood up, unzipped the suitcase and flipped it open so its contents were visible. A man entered the office carrying Isma's passport, laptop and phone. She allowed herself to hope, but he sat down, gestured for her to do the same, and placed a voice recorder between them. Do you consider yourself British? The man said. I am British. But do you consider yourself British? I have lived here all my life. She meant there was no other country of which she could feel herself apart. But the words came out sounding evasive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmela, for sharing that.